Hi, and welcome to lecture one for Psych 5301 Research Methods. So today's goal in this lecture is to give a review of classical, what we will begin calling frequentist statistical inference. Now this is going to be a bit of a long lecture because uh, usually everything that I'm covering today takes most of a semester to really get through. So we'll go quickly, but it still might be a while, so I, I ask that you be patient, but we'll get a lot out of it. We'll try to get all of what you have previously learned in your statistics course kind of condensed into a nice, uh, easy to digest narrative. So I wanna begin with an example. Let's suppose that we are testing some treatment that has been proposed to increase intelligence. And by that, I mean that which we would measure by some IQ test. So here are the specifics of the problem. We've got a sample of 25 people that are given the treatment, and we find that the average IQ for this sample is X bar equals 107. Now, of course, we know that uh, mean IQ in the population by design of the test is 100. So this is, a, this is a bit higher than that. Our question is, did the treatment work? In other words, did this treatment um, increase IQ beyond what you would expect from the general population? Now, of course, that's a question that we can answer in many ways, and the point of today is to figure out, uh, or, or at least to review, how we do answer that question. Well, of course, you know uh, by being uh, in this course that we do answer these questions by translating research questions like we've asked here into statistical questions. And specifically what we mean by that is the following. Let's let the Greek letter mu represent the mean of the population who received the treatment. Okay, so this is your treatment group at the population level. You've got a sample of them, a sample of, remember, 25 people, but we want to know if you, gave, if you gave an entire population this treatment, would it increase the IQ? Would it increase intelligence beyond what you would expect in general, which is 100? So statistically, our question then is, is mu greater than 100, which of course is the average IQ for the general population. How do we answer that? Well, there are two methods that we're going to review today. One is that we can estimate this unknown mu, this uh, mean of the population that received the treatment, from our sample, x bar. And this is more generally called parameter estimation. We'll refer to it many times like that this semester. And the other method is to test competing hypotheses about this unknown mu. And we call this process model comparison. So without further ado, let's begin with parameter estimation and recall how that works. So parameter estimation simply asks the question, what is the value of mu? You've defined mu to be this unknown population mean, this parameter, what is it? Uh, well, we don't know exactly what it is, but we can, get, uh, we can get a good estimate of what it is from our data. And the way we do this, of course, you know from earlier courses, is that we know that 95% of sample means from a population are within about two standard deviations of the population mean. Now, I say about two standard deviations because technically you get 95% coverage within 1.96 standard deviations of that population mean. And when you take samples, that standard deviation is actually the standard error of the mean, which you might remember is sigma, the standard deviation divided by square root of n. This distribution of sample means gives us kind of the picture of what happens when you take sample means in general. And the picture is sample means tend to pile up around the population mean, and 95% of them are in this shaded region. And that shaded region is exactly 1.96 times the standard error um, in width on the right side and the left side. So what do we do with this? How does this lead to uh, helping us with estimation? Well, the answer is that this gives us a probability statement. This says that there is a 95% probability that any given sample mean is going to be between this number, which is this little left endpoint up here, and this number, which is this right endpoint. Okay, that's a 95% probability that that's going to happen. So what can we do with this? Well, this tells us that a sample mean x bar is going to be uh, greater than or equal to this and less than or equal to this with 95% probability. Now, we're interested in what mu is, right? We would like to get a handle on how big mu is. We don't know it, but if we do a little bit of algebra, we can actually isolate mu and put it in the middle, and it looks like this. 
Okay, now uh, you, you are welcome to do the algebra to verify this. It's a nice little exercise. But the point is that we can say something about mu being between this number, which is your sample mean minus 1.96 times that standard error, and your sample mean plus 1.96 times that standard error. And that is exactly the motivation that gives us the classical definition for a confidence interval. So let's recall what a confidence interval is, specifically a 95% confidence interval. Well, it's defined as this interval. It's the interval you get when you take x bar minus 1.96 times uh, the standard error uh, all the way up to x bar plus 1.96 times the standard error. Okay, so let's go back to our example and let's do this estimation. Let's estimate mu using a 95% confidence interval. So recall from what we said in the example, our treatment sample of n equals 25 had a mean of 107. Now let's compute this 95% confidence interval. Okay, so we start, uh, first of all, we need a little bit of information in the background here. So you might need to go back to what you've learned at some point, but for IQ scores, we need this bit of information. We need that the sigma, the population standard deviation, is equal to 15, okay? Now, once we have that, we've got everything we need to do our 95% our confidence interval. So by definition, it's simply this interval. The left endpoint is x bar minus 1.96 times sigma over root n. And the right endpoint is that, okay? Let's uh, plug in what we know. We put in the sample mean of 107, and we put in sigma equals 15 and we put in n equals 25. Okay, we do that on uh, both ends. Now we want to figure out what all this is. We take 1.96 times 15 divided by square root of 25, and we get what's called a margin of error, okay, of 5.88. In fact, let's write that in here just to remember that that's what this number is called. This is called the margin of error. So that means that our confidence interval is going to be centered at 107, and we're going to go to the left by 5.88 and to the right by 5.88. And we can see that here. When we subtract and then add 5.88, we get a 95% confidence interval of 101.12 to 112.88. So this says that we are 95% confident that mu is between those two numbers, 101.12 and 112.88. Now that's a pretty wide range, okay? But you might note that since our estimate is all greater than 100, right? Our lowest, the, the lowest estimate in our interval is still greater than 100. We can say based on this confidence interval that our treatment worked, okay? Even though we don't know exactly what mu is, we're 95% confident it's between these two numbers. They're all bigger than 100. So we're pretty sure that the treatment worked. Now, what, what, what is hypothesis testing? How is that different? Well, let's recall the mechanics of hypothesis testing. So the way hypothesis testing works is we define two competing hypotheses, or what we're gonna start calling later this semester models, about that population parameter mu. Specifically, we usually define two hypotheses. Again, this is the classical inference that we're talking about here. The first of them that we uh, define is H0, it's called the null hypothesis, and it's, it's a hypothesis that supposes there's no treatment effect. So if there were no treatment effect, then this unknown treatment mean would be the same as the population mean, which is 100. So the null hypothesis, H0, is defined as mu equals 100. On the other hand, if the treatment worked, uh, that treatment mean, or that uh, the population mean of that treatment group would be bigger than 100. So we define a hypothesis H1, called an alternative hypothesis, as one that reflects that positive treatment effect, namely mu bigger than 100. Now, basically, we want to see which of these two models best explains our data. So here's how we do it. This is the classical dull hypothesis testing technique. The first thing that we do is we assume that the null is true. And we just say, suppose, you know, for, for, uh, for lack of anything better to guess, let's suppose that the null is true. So what that means is that mu is equal to 100. What we then do is we ask ourselves the following. We say, what is the probability of observing our sample mean, which is a sample mean of 107, or even more extreme, if the null is true? Okay, so this turns into a probability statement. 
So really what we need to do is compute this. We need to compute the probability that x bar is bigger than 107. Okay? Now, of course, how do you do that? The way we do it is we translate this observed data statement, this, uh, this statement about getting a sample mean at least as big as 107. We translate it into a statistic, uh, more generally a test statistic. In the first sort of round of hypothesis testing that you probably learned, that means that we're going to translate it to a z-score or a z-statistic. So remember how that works. A z-score looks like this. You take the sample mean minus the population mean and you divide by the standard error. So let's see what we know. What can we plug in? Well, we know x-bar. That's our observed sample mean. It was 107. Now, what about mu? Well, on one hand, we don't know mu because mu is an unknown quantity, right? We're making hypotheses about it. But remember this little technical piece right here. We started the process by assuming that H0 is true. And H0 is a hypothesis that says mu is equal to 100. So if H0 is true, that means we have a value for mu, namely it's 100. Right? See, this wouldn't work in the way that we do it if we didn't start with that assumption. We also know sigma. Uh, same reason as earlier, the, for the IQ test, sigma is 15. And then square root of n is going to be square root of 25. Okay. So we figure all this out. We just uh, do a little bit of simplification. Oops, let me get rid of that. Okay. So when we do this, we uh, get an observed difference of 7 up top. This translates down to 15 over 5, which is 3. 7 over 3 is equal to 2.33. Okay. So now what we can do is we can translate our statement about the probability that x bar is bigger than 107 to a statement about, um, about z-scores. Okay. We want to know what is the probability. Hang on one second here. We want to know, let me put it in blue, we want to translate this to the probability that z is bigger than or equal to 2.33. So what's the probability of getting a z-score bigger than or equal to 2.33? In your previous course, you may have done this using a statistical table or something like that. I actually want to introduce you to an app that we can use. You can use it on your computer, an iPad, or a phone. It really doesn't matter. Uh, the address for this app, it's an interactive web application that I wrote for teaching these kinds of courses. Uh, it's in the description below. It's on your Canvas page, and I'm about to show it to you. So let's go to a browser, and here is the link. It's, I'll just say it. It's tomfalconberry.shinyapps.io slash dist underscore calc. Okay? Again, the link is in the notes below this video. The way it works is you can put in things about this distribution, and you can ask yourself, what's the probability in certain regions? So for example, uh, from what we just worked, we know that we want to find the probability that z is bigger than or equal to 2.33. Okay? Well, this app lets us have a normal distribution with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. That is a z distribution. And we can find the upper tail or lower tail or both tails. In this case, we want an upper tail, right? We want the probability beyond a certain point. Uh, a. In this case, that A needs to be entered as 2.33. And if I do that, you'll see over here that we get, um, we, we get it updated to uh, this probability right here. This little shaded part is the part of the distribution that is beyond uh, 2.33. And that probability is 0 0.0099. Okay, so I'm going to write that on my screen here go back to uh, there. So that probability is 0 0.0099. Okay. So how did we get that? We got that from the app. Um, that probability, by the way, has a special name. You've probably heard this word before, but you might not have known what it was. This probability is called a p-value. Okay, so we're going to refer to p-values a lot this semester, and that's exactly what on earth was all that. That's exactly what we mean by that. That is your p-value. So what do we do with this, right? What we do with this is the following. Our conclusion is our data, our observed mean of 107, is rare if the null is true, right? This is saying that if the null is true, the probability of observing our data is really darn small, okay? It's less than 1% 
okay? So that's, that's how we would say our data is rare under the null. We usually use 5% as a threshold for rareness, okay? So that's the whole act of looking for p less than 0.05, that's what I mean by that. So in this case, we've got a p-value that's very small. It's less than 5%, it's even less than 1%. So our conclusion is that the data is rare. Well, so what? Well, what that means is that the null is probably not a good model for the data that we've observed. So we reject the null as a plausible hypothesis, right? If the null were true, we would have a very small probability of obtaining the data that we just observed. So we kind of reverse that logic and say, you know what, let's throw out null. Uh, we're going to reject that. It's no longer plausible. If we reject the null, then that gives us some indirect support for the other one, the alternative. And so we can conclude that we have support for this hypothesis, that mu is bigger than 100. That's how hypothesis testing works, okay? So quick technical note, okay? That's, that's, that's the basics. We're now going to kind of shift gears and get a little bit more into this. You may have noticed in our example that we knew the population standard deviation sigma. Okay, it just happens to be that the IQ test example that we used, uh, we know something about that. It's a normed test, and so we know, what, uh, we know what the population mean and population standard deviation are. What happens if we're not given that information? Okay? Well, that's what I want to discuss in the rest of this lecture. So here's another example that we're going to work with. Let's suppose we have a population with a mean of 23, and we have a sample of four that's given an experimental treatment, and the resulting scores were these, 20, 22, 22, and 20. Now, of course, the question is, does the treatment result in a significantly lower score? Okay. Now, it certainly looks on the surface like that's the case, right? These are all less than 23, but this word significantly uh, means, you know, beyond sort of a measurement error threshold. Now, of course, the reason we can't just jump right into working this is we're not given a fundamental piece of information. If you were to try to construct a confidence interval or do a hypothesis test, you would run into a block. You would need a value for sigma that we're not given. Right? We know nothing about this population other than here are four scores from it. So we don't know sigma. What can we do? So let's talk about that. How do we get sigma? Well, the first thing you might try is, well, let's say maybe we can just estimate it from our observed data. We know how to compute a standard deviation, right? We know how to compute a standard deviation, and what do we do? We take the uh, sum of squared deviations, right? We'll do an example in just a second, where you take each data point, you subtract the mean, and then you square them, then you add them up and divide by n. So in short notation, it's this. It's the square root of the sum of squares over n. So maybe that works, okay? That would be cool. But the problem is that that little estimator, which I'm calling S here, tends to be too small. Now, it's beyond the, the goal of this lecture to show you why that's the case, but you can do computer simulations really pretty easily to see it. If you're interested in that, just let me know, uh, let me know in other methods, and we'll, we'll take, I'll make a little video about that. But the point is, it's not a good estimator for sigma. It systematically underestimates sigma. So what to do? Well, what we do is we simply fix the formula. We're going to do a correction to the formula. So the formula that we want to try is this, right? We want to take the sum of squares divided by n. Well, if you want to make that just a little bit bigger, what you can do is divide by something a little bit smaller. And that's what motivates this formula. This formula, the only difference is instead of dividing by n, I'm dividing by n minus 1, okay? And that is how we estimate sigma. In fact, we give it this notation, this sigma with a hat on it. Let me say what that is. This is called sigma hat, okay? That's how you read this notation. Uh, estimators in statistics are often given that hat notation. It just means that this is, to, this is a thing that I can estimate from data to uh, give a close approximation to the population parameter. Okay. So sigma hat is found by doing this. It's basically find the standard deviation the way you usually would, but instead of dividing by n, instead of finding the average sum of uh, the average squared deviation, you divide by one less than that, n minus one. In some books, this is called the sample standard deviation. I really don't like that approach because those books typically 
uh, they they split it into population standard deviation and sample standard deviation. They do them both at the same time, and the beginning student has no idea why there's two different standard deviations, and I think that just kind of derails the whole discussion of statistics from there. But at this point, you can now get uh, sort of the enlightened approach of, oh, that's this is why we do this. This is why we divide by a little bit less. We divide by slightly smaller number, and that fixes the bias. Okay. So let's work this out. Let's go back to this example. Uh, but we can't quite go there yet. Uh, okay, fine. But here's the next problem, okay? Because we've changed something, right? We've now estimated sigma instead of knowing sigma. So if we were to compute these z-scores, okay, and I put this in quotes for a reason, if we were to compute these things like we did before, that distribution no longer turns out to be a normal distribution. Why is that important? Well, in the, uh, in the app a second ago, these calculations that we were doing were based on using a normal distribution. And so what I'm telling you at this point is if we use this approach where we estimate sigma from data, we no longer get to use a normal distribution. What is it that we get to use? Well, what we get to use is something called the T distribution. And you've probably heard of this before because you've done T tests before. This is where it comes from. I'll mention that the details of this were worked out a long time ago by a guy named William Seeley Gossett. He worked for Guinness Brewery. Um, he couldn't publish the work under his name, and so he published it in Biometrica under a pseudonym, a pseudonym called Student. That's why this is referred to as the Student's T-Test. There's a very nice history of this paper given in uh, Zabel uh, 2008 uh, in the Journal of the American Statistical Association. So if you're interested in that sort of historical aspect, I invite you to read it. Basically, what happens is the T distribution, the distribution of those scores that we just wrote a second ago, turn out the shape of that distribution depends heavily on the sample size. Okay, so the, the distribution has an extra parameter and it's called degrees of freedom. Uh, degrees of freedom is nothing more than that denominator, n minus one, that we used before. So, a, so what this means is that uh, samples of different size give a different sampling distribution. Uh, specifically, the relationship is the smaller the sample size, the fatter the tails. So if you've got something like with a sample size of n equals 25, like we had earlier, that's the blue curve, has kind of nice thin tails. But if you get uh, a smaller sample, like say n equals 5, uh, which is close to what we're doing on this example, then you get this red curve, which has much fatter tails. What that's going to do is it's going to change the probabilities of every possible score you could get from your samples. So what this means is that you have to specify the, the sample size, or more technically, the degrees of freedom when you calculate probabilities. Okay, So we're going to do that, and the app that I uh, introduced you to helps us do this. So let's go back to the example and work it out. Uh, remember the example is we have a population with a mean of 23. We take a sample of four, and they're given an experimental treatment, and these were their scores, and we want to know, does the treatment result in significantly lower scores? Okay. So we're going to start just like we did before. We're going to let mu be the mean of the treatment population. This is kind of a mad libs for how you would do a, a hypothesis test. Uh, first of all, note that if you go in and compute the mean of these four scores, you get x bar equals 21. Okay. Now we're going to define two hypotheses, a null hypothesis, which says that the population treatment mean is the same as the original population, which is 23. And then we get an alternative, which says it is lower than 23, right? The alternative should be in the same direction as the research question. The research question was, is it significantly lower? So here's our two hypotheses. We start by assuming that the null is true. And our goal is to find the probability of observing our data or more extreme if the null is true. So we want to know that probability. Now, just like before, uh, we convert that observe data into a test statistic. In this case, we're going to convert it into a T statistic, but before we can do that, we need an estimate of sigma. We need sigma hat. So we know that from our earlier discussion that to compute sigma hat, this so-called sample standard deviation, we need the sum of squares, and then we'll divide by n minus 1 and take the square root. So let's remember how that works. Uh, let's take our four data points that we have. We've got 20, 22, 22, and 20. Uh, the sum of squares is we take the deviations from the mean, so 20 minus 21, which is negative 1, 22 minus 21, which is 1, 
1, negative 1. Then we square them, so each of those gets squared to a positive 1. We then take the sum of those squares, right? That's the sum of squares part. So the sum of squares is 4. And so from this, sigma hat is easy to find. Sigma hat is the square root of, of SS over N minus 1, which is simply the square root of 4 over 3. And we take the square root of 4 over 3, and that gives us the number 1.15. So that is our estimate of sigma. Let's now use it. Let's compute the t-score, and then we'll compute the probability of getting that t-score or smaller. So the t-score looks just like a z-score. The only reason it's called t is it's a fundamentally different distribution that's being compared on. It's still a z-score, but uh, it's no longer a z-distribution. Uh, we need x-bar, which we knew. We need mu, which we assume to be 23. We just found sigma hat, and we know that n equals 4. So let's put all that together. So it'll be 21 minus 23 over 1.15 divided by square root of 4. Let's get rid of that. That will simplify to negative 2 up top, and then the bottom will simplify to, just use a calculator, 0 0.575, which if we then go and find that, that is negative 3.48. So now we need to know what is the probability that t is less than that score, negative 3.48. So we're going to go to the app to find this out. Let's go back to that app. Here it is. Now, before we used a normal distribution, but this time we're going to use a t distribution. Anytime you don't know sigma, you're going to be using a t distribution. Now, when we do that, it asks us to specify the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is going to be one less than the sample size. Sample size was four, so the degrees of freedom is three. Now we want to know what's the probability that something's less than negative 3.48. So that means we need a lower tail. Notice how this little notation changes to the correct side. And we're going to put in negative 3.48. Okay. And when we do that, we get a p-value of 0.02. Okay, that's 2% of the distribution is beyond that negative value. Okay, so it's pretty small. Let's go back to our notes and copy that over. So from the app, and after specifying that uh, degrees of freedom was equal to 3, we get a p-value of 0 0.02. So that's pretty small, right? It's less than 5%. So how do we do, uh, what do we do with all this? Well, since p is less than 0.05, we say that our data is rare if the null is true. Okay, it's saying this again says if the null is true, we shouldn't have obtained the data that we did. But here it is, so it must mean that the uh, null hypothesis is not plausible. So what we do then is we say we reject the null in favor of H1, the alternative, that is that mu is less than 23, and this lets us conclude that the treatment results in significantly lower scores. So all the mechanics are the same. The only thing that's different is in these situations, scroll back up, you have to find sigma hat from the data, and then you have to use the t distribution to find your p-value. Okay. Okay. So what about confidence intervals? Right. This is the last thing that I want to talk about today. So we've done hypothesis testing in this situation. Let's go to confidence intervals. Well, we talked a little bit earlier in the lecture about those. We remember that we can estimate a 95% confidence interval for an unknown population mean mu by using the sample mean and the population standard deviation. So remember, it looked something like this, x bar plus or minus 1.96 times sigma over square root of n. So what do we do here? Well, you know that the, the issue here is that we don't know sigma. So what happens to this when we don't know sigma? Well, if we're not given sigma, you might think, well, let's just use our estimate. Let's just put in sigma hat. That's a perfectly fine idea, but there's a few things that we have to adjust. Okay? It sort of works, but we have to adjust the 1.96. So in other words, this part right here is no longer going to hold. So what do we do? Why, why is this the case? Well, there's two reasons. One is that 1.96 is only used for normal distribution, because in that case, 95% of your sample means fall uh, between negative 1.96 times the standard error and 1.96 times the standard error. This always assumes that sigma is known. So when that's not the case, right? if you're estimating sigma with sigma hat, remember, you don't get a normal distribution anymore. Instead, you get a t distribution. And the exact shape of that distribution depends on the size of the sample. So what that tells you is if you're going back up to here and you're thinking, how am I going to change 
ah, it's going to be different for every possible sample size. Oh, goodness. Well, it's not too bad. In light of this, here's how we're going to adjust. We're going to say, let's define a generalized confidence interval. The only thing different is we're going to put in sigma hat instead of sigma. And we're going to put in this weird bit of symbol here, this T star DF. And that's just going to be a value that can change depending on sample size. Specifically, the definition of T star DF is it's the value of T which leaves 5% of the distribution in the two tails combined. I'll show you exactly what that means in just a second. It turns out, uh, by the way, this is called the critical value of the T distribution. You may have seen that before. And it's totally, totally easy to find from the distribution calculator app. Okay, I'll show you that as we work this example. So let's go back to the example. Now remember earlier we found that the sample mean was 21, so we're gonna use that as the center of our confidence interval. And we found sigma hat equal 1.15. Let's make a confidence interval. Now from the app, we need to go and, uh, let's, I uh, got a little bit too far ahead of myself here. We need to go to the app, we need to find T star DF, okay? All right, we need to find T star DF. So let's go back to the app how does this work? Well, when you put in your degrees of freedom, right, that changes the shape. If I were to change this all of a sudden to four, it would make the, the, the tails a little bit flatter. So I'm going to put in degrees of freedom of three, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to select both tails. And you might notice that the, the app defaults to a value that leaves 5% in those tails. It leaves a p-value of 0.05. That's exactly T star DF. T star DF is this number right here, which is about three, well, it's actually over here. It's the positive of it, but it's 3.18. It is the value of T, which leaves 5% in the tails. So basically, T star DF pops out by default. If I put in a different degrees of freedom, like 10, this number down here would change, okay? Oops, I went to my website all of a sudden. That's not what I wanted to do. Let me go back here. So if I put in 10, this number changes. I put back to three, this number changes automatically. So you get it from the app by simply putting in the degrees of freedom after the T distribution, and it gives you the T star DF. Okay, so that's kind of a nice little thing. Let's go back and write that down. So let me get rid of that little thing right there. So that tells us that T star DF is 3.18. Now we have everything we need. The 95% confidence interval is gonna be X bar plus or minus T star DF times all that. That's 21 plus or minus 3.18, which I just found, times sigma hat, which is 1.15, divided by the square root of four. So let's figure out this margin of error. Okay, this margin of error turns out to be 1.83 when you do the, the arithmetic there. And so if we take 21 minus 1.83 and 21 plus 1.83, we get this interval 19.17 up to 22.83. There's my 95% confidence interval. Okay, so the, the technicality is it's mostly the same. It's just that when you don't know sigma, you've got to estimate it, and that's going to change the distribution we use. But thankfully, we have tools to find the adjustment. Okay, so let's finish up here. Let's just recall what we talked about in this uh, rather long lecture. I promise they won't always be this long. Uh, first thing is we always translate research questions to statistical questions about population parameters. So the types of parameters will vary through the semester. Right now we're estimating population means, so like things like mu. Estimation means that we compute 95% confidence intervals for mu. And hypothesis testing means we define competing hypotheses about mu. We assume the null is true. And then we, uh, the, the game is if, that, if our data are rare under that null hypothesis, we reject it and conclude support for the alternative. It's kind of a backwards way of getting support for the thing we're interested in. Now, in problems where sigma is unknown, we have to do some adjustment. We have to estimate it from the data, which uh, requires us to use a totally different distribution of sample means. And the result are the mechanics of the t-test. So that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, let me know, and I look forward to seeing you next time.